Let's go Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you today for giving us this opportunity uh, to be still. To be still and to, to not move and not wonder and not run crazy. Now the challenge becomes our mind being still. Our, our emotions being still. Being in a place where we can hear and, and see you. Being in a place where we can literally lean into you, not away from you. Lord, we know there's always things that is that, it, that is barring for our time, that, it, that is trying to distract us, It's trying to get us to miss the opportunities we have to be here. It's one thing to walk through the doors, and that's, that's the first accomplishment. The next accomplishment is actually maximizing this moment and this time. And the enemy, he wanted to stop us from getting here, but we got here. And now he wants to stop us from receiving whatever it is that we're going to receive from you in these next few moments. And we don't want that to happen. Lord, we can't let that happen because whatever it is that you're going to speak over our hearts, our spirits and minds, we need to hear. And so, Lord, we know that the enemy wants to do nothing but to still kill and destroy everything that we are. The hope that we have, the peace that we have, the joy that we have. Lord, the words that are that are going to be spoken today that are going to shape us and form us into a deeper relationship with you. And that's our goal, Lord, to leave this place closer to you than when we walked in. And so, Lord, this is the first and foremost thing we do. We completely and utterly, we, we give ourselves to you. We give you our thoughts, we give you our minds, and we give you this time. Lord, in the next few moments, just have your way with us. Lord, may you do what needs to be done. And Lord, we know this will happen as we claim it in your name, the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus, the name that has power and authority. The Bible says that the enemy, he flees at the mere mention of your name. And so therefore we claim this in the name of Jesus. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. So this morning uh, we are starting a, 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 new, a new series. It's a short series. Um, it's only probably going to be maybe five, six weeks, uh, you know, a couple of maybe disruptions in there. With Mother's Day, we'll probably take a break in there and do something real fun for the moms, but it's always for all of us. And there's no telling what God may have in store. But what we're doing is we're starting a series where we are going to be looking at the, the stories that Jesus told. Jesus told a lot of stories. And when you look through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will see that this was Jesus' most common way of getting a point across. If he was ever talking to a group of people, if he was ever in an argument with the Pharisees, if he was ever in the argument with the religious elitists, he would oftentimes tell a story. And the reason why he told stories is because he knew that stories is the language of the heart. Oftentimes, people will not pay attention to a lot of things. You can be just rambling on, but then you start telling a good story, and all of a sudden, you pay attention. There are stories that you've told about your life that I will always remember because it was a good story. And there was a point to it. Some of you tell really pointless stories, but most of you tell <laughs> stories that actually have a purpose. And, and it really it, it makes a difference. And Jesus knew that. He knew that this was the language of the heart. And, and he would tell stories, and he would tell, uh, 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 he would tell them often. Now, some of the stories we're going to explore over the next several weeks, they'll be familiar to you. You've heard them before. And that's a good thing. But here's what I want you to understand. You'll have the ones you know, and then there'll be some that you don't. The ones you know, we've got to be careful with familiarity. Because the Bible is living and breathing, meaning that you can read this passage this morning at 9.30 and read it this afternoon at 2.30, and I promise you, you'll get something different. Because God's going to speak to you differently this afternoon at 2.30 than he did at 9.30 this morning. And I believe that if you allow God to minister to you the next several weeks and open your heart, you're going to receive layer after layer after layer of fresh application through these, these stories. I know, I know I have. Just preparing, I know I have. And I am really excited. I hope you're excited too. Okay, you come, maybe? I know it's like rainy and nasty and some of you stayed up late last night watching The Voice or whatever it is you watch, I don't know. 
But you know what? It's going to be a good time today. We're, we're going to jump into Luke's gospel. We're going to be in the 15th chapter, and we're going to be talking about a story that will be familiar to many of us, but I believe you're going to receive something different. We're going to be talking about the prodigal sons. We're going to be talking about the prodigal sons. Now, many of you know that story as the prodigal son, and many of us know that as, and, we, and it's been taught as the prodigal son, but it's the prodigal sons. And a lot of times people just look at the one son who, who ran off from home and got himself into a little bit of mischief. But you're going to find as you read this story and you read so the way it's written that both of these sons were actually prodigal. They were both wasteful and they both had issue. One was lost and one stays home, but they were actually both lost. And we're going to see that today. Are you ready to jump in? Yes. All right, we're going to begin in chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want a, I want a share of your estate now before you die. Now, this poor guy, right off the bat, we see he doesn't understand how inheritances work. Right? He, he wants it now. Before he, he dies, I don't know what his issue is, but he doesn't understand how inheritances work, and he wants it now. And what we've got to understand is, in this day, they didn't have necessarily trust funds or large bank accounts. It wouldn't have been like, hey, you know, Dad, I want you to go get, you know, the uh, $50,000 you promised me. I want it now. No, no, no. Oftentimes, they didn't have the trust funds. They didn't have the savings accounts. They had property. They had property, and they had livestock, they had a business. And so get, to get an inheritance would have meant that they would have had to liquidate some of their estate. Now, in this case, the older brother would have been entitled to two-thirds, and the younger brother would have been entitled to one-third. And what the younger brother is saying is, I want you to sell off one-third of the estate. I want you to sell off one-third of the business. He's essentially putting the family's bis business at risk. There's a lot going on here. And essentially he's saying, I, I don't care about the family business. I don't care about the family property. I don't care about any of those things. I want my money because I want to go to Vegas. And you're going to find out why here in a few minutes. This is what he's saying. He's saying, uh, he's saying that uh, he wants it now. And you'll find this is also going to understand why the other brother may have some emotional issues, issues later. Now, this is a shocking demand. It really is. This would have been a shocking request that he would make and ask this big of a favor. And what's even more shocking is the father's going to give it to him. Watch what verse 12 says. You continue. His father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, the younger son packed up all of his belongings and moved to a distant land. There, he wasted all of his money on wild living. Isn't that a fun way the scriptures put it? And any of you like to read between the lines? We get this, right? He goes to the Vegas of his day, and he parties like a rock. He parties like a rock star. That's a song. You probably don't know it. And he goes to all the finest restaurants, and he goes to all the finest clubs, and he buys all the best food, and he's just, he's going to the nightclubs, he's going to the hot spots, and he's dropping dollars left and right, and he's having a good time, and he's living it up. And just about the time his money runs out, watch what happens. Verse 14, and about the time his money runs out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man becomes so hungry that he even that, that even the pods that the pigs were feeding on looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Now, he runs out of money. His money runs out about the same time that the economy tanks. And so all of a sudden, he's out of money. The, the economy and the job market is falling apart. His friends leave him. He has no family support around him. And his life is falling apart. And the best option that this Jewish boy has is to hang out with the Gentile pigs. Uh, it's, 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 this is embarrassing. It's demoralizing. And is a true example of struggling. Of someone who is truly struggling. In verse 17, it says he comes to his senses. Look at verse 17. When he finally comes to his senses, he said to himself, 
at home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. Now, I know that throughout the church and throughout, throughout Bible studies and a lot of Sunday school classes, and you've probably heard sermons preached a lot about this passage. And I know oftentimes this passage is preached on, and right here it teaches us about remorse, and it teaches us about repentance. Can I tell you something? I'm not sold on that. I don't believe this is an example of repentance. I don't believe this is an example of, of being remorse. You know what I think this is? I think this is an example of desperation. I think you see a guy here who has no other options. He's like, I've spent all my money, and, and uh, I've got nobody to help me. I can't get a job because the economy, everything's falling, nobody's hiring. This is, a, this is an issue. Yeah, he's looking at his options. He's thinking the best option he has is to go back home to his dad and hope he receives grace and hope he receives mercy. And you know, it's interesting. You don't see him saying anything about going home and asking for forgiveness. You don't see him saying, I have failed miserably. I have let my father down. I've let my family down. I have done horrible things. And I need forgiveness. And I need grace. No, no. He says, I'll go back. I made a mistake. And surely I'll be treated better than when I'm being treated here with the pigs. Now, this was a significant risk, guys, by the way. We need to acknowledge this. This was a big risk because not only was it just about his dad accepting him, during this time, it was a community that would have been accepting him. They were a tight-knit Jewish community, and he would have disgraced all of them by doing what he did. He didn't just leave his father. He left his community, and they didn't take this lightly. As a matter of fact, the community would oftentimes take these matters in their own hands. It's like, you know what? You, you, you didn't just hurt him, you hurt us. And, and they would have this ceremony called the, the Kizaze. And what this would look like is that they would take a jar of burnt corn and nuts. You, why do they use burnt corn and nuts? I have no clue. Google it. But they would take it and they would throw it on the foot and the feet of whoever it is that had disgraced them. And they would slam it at their feet, busting the burnt corn and busting the burnt nuts all over their feet, symbolizing that they were cut off, that they were exiled, that they were no longer welcome in that community. And that this is exactly what they would do. And so there, there's a lot going on here. So as you can imagine, the boy was hoping that he could sneak into town without being noticed. You ever try to sneak into places without being noticed? I've seen people try to sneak into church without being noticed. You know, people, we go, we sometimes we go to places and we're trying not to be noticed. And he was hoping that he could slide back in, somehow get into his dad's farm. His dad would accept him back. He could just blend into the employment force and it would be no big deal. Which makes, guys, and I'm bringing this up for a reason. Because it makes this next verse even more powerful, guys. This is what the thing is about. This is the dangers with familiarity. When we can become so familiar with these passages that we miss some of the most powerful things that are happening. Look at verse 20. Here, here we go. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Guys, right here, this is important, which implies that his father was actually looking for him. Let that sink in for a second. This, this, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. And being filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son and he embraced him and he kissed him. Now, everything about the scripture is shocking. The dad is looking for him. The dad is eagerly seeking him. The dad is seeking the horizon and watching for his boy. And the Bible says he ran to him. I don't know about you, but have you ever had anyone, have you had anyone ever hurt you? And you knew you were going to forgive them, but you made them pay for it for like a few minutes. Am I the only one? It's like, you know, you know you're going to forgive them, but you like get the text and you're like, I'm not responding. I'm going to make them sweat. You get the email and you're like, I don't respond. Let them sit over there on the other end and think I'm really angry. 
Anybody? Okay, you can hang me out, it's fine. I like to call this marriage, but no. <laughs> but you're like, you're, you're just like, you're gonna forgive them. But you, you, you want to you wanna make them pay a little bit. And, and so this is the opposite of that. The father, the, the father is searching and scanning the horizon. And he sees the silhouette of his boy. And he takes off running towards him. Some of your Bible says that he takes off like a foot race. I don't know about you, but if you've ever seen a grown man over the age of 38 years old try to sprint, it's hilarious. <laughs> And he takes off sprinting towards them. I got to be honest, if it would be me, if it had been me, I think I probably would have maybe made him sweat a little bit. Maybe, you know, look in the opposite direction, head in the backyard. Tell, make sure you tell him I'm busy. Let him hang out for a few days. Make him feel a little bit more and more. No, no, no. This dad, this dad runs to him. Why? Because he was glad to see him. But guys, don't miss this. He's glad to see his son, but he knows something. He's got to get to his boy before everybody else does. He's got to get to his son. Remember that whole jar of nuts and corn? He's got to get to him before the community exiles him, before they cut him off. And he's looking for his son. He's longing for his son. And he says, son, you need to get to me so that we can face whatever it is that's going to come your way together. And that way you won't be alone in any of this. I need to embrace you. I need to be there for you. And this is, guys, this is what I want you to see. Jesus tells these stories because Jesus wants you to see the heart of Jesus. He wants you to see how he truly feels about you. He wants you to see how your heavenly father feels about you. That we have a heavenly father who loves us. We have a heavenly father who desires us. We have a heavenly father who is searching for us, who is wanting us, who is always looking out for you, scanning the horizon, looking for you, running to you, and welcome you regardless of what you've done. Regardless of what you do. This is who your dad is. And this is why Jesus told this story. And so here's the question I would ask every single one of us. It's a very important question. How do you see your God? How do you view your God? We all have a, we have a, a viewpoint of him. And it's important that we ask this question. Because let me tell you why. The way you view your God, the way you view your Heavenly Father affects the way you live. Completely. It, it affects the way you talk. It affects you the way you walk. It affects the way you encounter people. You, the, your view of God affects your relationship with other people. It affects your relationship with yourself. It affects the way you look in the mirror. It affects the way you see people that are different than you. It affects the way you see people that are broken maybe a little differently than you. The people maybe that believe a little differently than you. That maybe act a little bit different than you. It affects the way this goes down. And I believe a lot of the dysfunction that we experience in the 21st century church comes down to a distorted view of who our God is. And how our God views people. And how our God views us. And you know, I believe every one of us has an image of God that comes to mind. You, you've heard me say this before. I think some of us view God is like a teacher or a college professor. And what I mean by that is, if we can just memorize the right answers, we get good at being churchy, don't we? You ever know people that are really good at being Christians? They know how to walk and talk and look the part. They know the right answers. They know the right verses. They have good attendance. So they think if I can just know the scriptures, if I can just go to church on the regular, then I'll be in his good graces. I go to Bible study, I attend Sunday school, I never miss a service. And I do all of these things because God is great in me. You see, that's how some of us view God. It's like we're like performing for our teacher. We're trying to get an A. We're, we're trying to get an A. And then some of us, we view God as a traffic cop. Yeah, everybody loves cops, right? They love that speed trap, don't you? You're like, why are you sitting there in the first place, right? Some of us, this is how we view God. We think God's setting back and he's setting up traps so that he can write us a ticket. Some of us think that, that God is just setting back, trying to put us in jail, trying to kill all of our fun, trying to catch us doing something wrong. And, and this is our viewpoint of him. It's just like that he's out to get us. 
I met a guy this past week in the sauna. He's supposed to be here today. We'll see. And, and he said, this is my problem with religion. Religion is suffocating. And, 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 and God, it's all about what you, you, know, you can't do. And I said, you were completely wrong. Because when you learn who your God is, you learn that there is freedom in him. 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. You see, this is the thing. With, with him, it's about what he allows you to do, not what you, you can't do. And, and it's about his love, and it's about his grace. It's not this imprisonment. Here's the thing. Jesus told these stories. To, to shape us into viewing who our Father is. And, and Jesus told this story to say, your God is a God of love, he's a God of grace, and he is always standing there with arms wide open, regardless of how messed up you are, regardless of how beyond repair you feel you are. If you feel you're pretty messed up, guess what? You're exactly who you are, who we came for. If you're kind of jacked up, you're exactly who he loves. If you're just a hot mess, guess what? You're exactly why you died on the cross. We left our boy being embraced by his father. Now he's going to break into his rehearsed speech. Let's get back to verse 21. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring and put it on his ring finger and sandals for his feet. Kill the calf that we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine, who was dead, has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he has been found. And so the party began. You see, I, I love this. The father doesn't even acknowledge the first part of what the son's saying. I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. He's like, I'm not even going to address those things. Look at the words that, that, that pop out right here. He says, you were dead. And now you are brought to life. You are lost, but now you are found. And my favorite line of all this, and so the party began. This kid went off to go do some wild living, and then he came home to the real party. Isn't that funny how that works? So the party began. You know, the Buddhist literature tells a story very similar to this one. And the details are like they're spot on right up until this part. Right up until this part, this is where the story changes in Buddhist literature. And in the Buddhist literature, at this point, the dad gives the son a shovel. And he says, you need to, uh, you need to begin shoveling excrement until you pay off your debt. And then you will be received appropriately. Do you see the difference? You see, this father throws a party. The other father puts him to work. And see, this is the gospel. The gospel, it, meaning the good news, is that you don't earn it. You don't deserve it. You don't even have to do anything and put in a bunch of work. It's about what's been done for you. Ephesians 2 eight says, for it is by grace that we are saved. That sums it up. It is by grace. It is by what has been done for you that you and I are saved, which means that when we come to the Father... We simply show up. Isn't that fantastic? Yeah. We don't have to be performing. We don't have to be doing all of these things to try to earn redemption. No, no, no. It's about what he has done for us. He redeems us from exile. He redeems us from being cut off. He redeems us from those jar of burnt nuts and corn being thrown at our feet. And here's the thing. He welcomes us again and again and again. Now, we could stop there, but remember I told you there were two lost sons. So let's keep reading. You still with me? Yes. I'm doing fine. We're almost done. If you're asleep, wake up. Jesus wants you back here. Verse, verse 25. When he returned home, this is the other son. Here we go. He heard loud music and dancing in the, in the house. And he, I don't know why, but every time I read that, I'm like, what were they listening to? <laughs> I mean, it was live music, so there's no telling. But, you know, he asked one of the servants what was going on. He says, your brother is back. And he was told, he was told that your father has uh, killed the fattened calf, and we are celebrating because of the safe return. Then the older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. 
His father came out and he begged him, but he replied, "All these years I have slaved for you, and you've never uh, once refused to do a, uh, you, and you've never once refused to do a single thing that you've told me to do. I've done everything you've told me to do, essentially. And in all that time, you've never e given me one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours, look at that, not my brother, when this son of yours." comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. Anybody in here grew up with a sibling or two and you were the good one? Anybody? I know what it's like to be the good one. <laughs> Anyways, I don't want to get struck by that. We're the, uh, but you were one of the good ones. You were the straight arrow. You were the good student. You were the one who did things right. Yet you didn't get the attention. You didn't get the affection. Why? Because the squeaky wheel always gets the grease, right? It's the really messed up kid that gets all the praise, right? It's the messed up kid that gets all the attention. The one who's working really hard, doing what's right, doing what needs to be done, they just get ignored. That's the brother's uh, story here that we're talking about. He stayed home and did his job. I mean, look at this. The dude is still in the fields working. He comes home from a hard day's work. He's been doing it day in, day out, while his brother's been living the Vida Loca. And he comes back, and they're celebrating him in his house. Live music, the best calf has been killed. They're having ribeyes, and the kid's wearing, like, the best robe ever. And the brother's out there still sweaty and covered in dirt. And he's like, seriously? Seriously, he has picked up the slack for his brother's mistakes day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and always worked hard. I bet he walked by his dad on a daily basis, watching his dad, scanning the horizon, looking to see if that, his brother was coming home. And I bet he walked by day in, day out, just thinking, what about me? Do you see me walking by? Do you see me here with the shovels? Do you see me here with my packs? Do you see me here doing what needs to be done? And you're not even looking over here. He's tired. He's emotionally and spiritually fatigued. He's in a valley. And this happens to many of us. Sometimes we do the right things. We say the right things. We put forth the right efforts. Yet it seemingly goes unnoticed and it goes unrewarded. We see others... We see others around us barely putting in any effort, being pretty wasteful, yet they get tons of attention. Seems like they constantly get favor. Why is it everything works out for them and not me? Jesus shows us that uh, there are some who are lost by their actions. They walk away, they go live the wild living, and then there are some who are lost that never believe. They allow life, emotions, frustrations, fatigue, and all of these things to get the best of them. Don't think for one second that there isn't some of us who have stayed home who think we are found where we are actually lost. Because we've got a lot of baggage and a lot of things that are hindering us and seeing what Jesus is trying to get us to see. And watch how the Father responds. Verse 31 and 32. The Father said, Look, dear son, you've always stayed by me, and everything I have is yours. Anytime you wanted a party, I would have thrown you a party. Anytime that you wanted a goat, I would have given you a goat. But we had to celebrate this day. We had to celebrate this moment. For your brother was dead and he has come back to life. He was lost and now he is found. And so the father says, I have always loved you. I have never stopped loving you. And if you wanted a party, you could have one. But son, we're having a party now. Your brother was lost and now he's found. Your brother was dead, and now he's alive again. And so he gives him this invitation to join the party. So what's the application? Well, how do you see your God? 
Do you see him for who he really is? A loving, graceful, embracing father who constantly stands there with arms wide open, searching the horizon for anyone who will, anyone who will come to him. And what's great is all you've got to do is set your feet towards him and then he runs to you. He runs to you. He loves you as you are. He runs to you and he saves you from exile, death, and shame. And today, God is giving you a direct invitation. Listen, somebody, I don't know who you are, but you, you need to listen to this. He is giving you a direct invitation that you are never too far gone. You're never too broken, never too ashamed, you're never too unworthy. Even though you may feel unworthy, even though you may feel ashamed, God is looking at you and he's saying, get in here. So just take the step. It's time to come home. And for those of you who stayed home, you better make sure that you're not lost. You better join the party. And when you see people receiving the grace of God that you don't feel deserve the grace, you better check yourself real fast. And when you see people receiving the love and mercy and goodness of God, you need to celebrate. In other words, here's the invitation for you. Join the party. Join the party. You know, one of the greatest ways to beat fatigue and feel refreshed is to be reminded of the Father's heart. And here's what we need to be reminded of. Every one of us in this room are all prophets. And he loves us all the same. Now Jesus doesn't tell us the response of another boy. You know why? Because it doesn't matter. The only response that matters is ours told this story because we are the ones who are going to finish it. The decision matters on us. How will we respond? If we've strayed, it's time to come home. And if we've stayed, it's time to join the party. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you for these wonderful stories that you told that were so intentional that ring throughout the ages, that have purpose, that have meaning. Lord, that are told, Lord, to minister to us thousands of years later that are so applicable. Lord, one of the things that we need to understand is that, Lord, your grace and your love is for everyone. Lord, it's for the one who continues to work in the field and who continues to do the right things daily. And Lord, it's for the one who goes off in the wild living and goes their own way and makes the wrong choices. Lord, we are so grateful that you are constantly looking for us. You're constantly scanning the horizon, standing there with your arms wide open to receive us into your good grace and your love and mercy. Lord, today, I don't know how we can't feel your loving arms around us, every single one of us. Not one of us is too far gone to receive your love. And Lord, not one of us is too good to not need it. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy. Lord, speak to every single one of us wherever we are right now. Don't let one of us leave this place the same way we came in. We pray these things in your holy, your precious, and your mighty name.